Okay, so this month we are going to talk about writing expressive tests with Google Test and Google Mock. Uh, we've talked about unit testing before. Uh, we'll give a brief overview of unit testing uh, and we won't go into tons of detail about Google Test. We will concentrate more on Google Mock. So, So what is a unit test? Just briefly, a unit test exercises a system in isolation. So we call it a unit test because we're going to exercise a single unit of code, which is either like a function or it's a method on a class, or sometimes it's a clump of related functions and methods. You can think of like an encoder decoder type situation. And when we say isolated, we're saying that all the external dependencies of the code we are exercising are under the control of the test. So that means things like the clock, the uh, a database, networking, all anything that talks to code outside of the code we're testing is under control of the test. <clears throat> so that's strict unit testing. And in a test, there's four phases. There's the setup phase where we orchestrate any necessary preconditions for the code we want to test the exercise phase where we call into the system under test to perform whatever it is we want to test the verify phase where we examine the results of the execution and validate that what we expected to happen did happen <clears throat> and then a teardown phase which is the opposite of setup that does any necessary cleanup to restore things back to a known state. Uh, so what are good unit tests? They should be isolated and independent. Isolated meaning they can be executed in any order. Um, they can be executed in parallel. Uh, so they don't share any state between tests. Um, and it, it doesn't matter which order I run them in. And I can run multi I can run tests in parallel, multiple tests, and because they're not sharing any state, they all uh, execute independently of each other. When you look at the source code for a test, the four phases should be obvious at a glance. Some a lot of times the teardown phase or the setup phase is either implicit and isn't directly visible, so you usually just see an exercise phase and a verify phase. But when you're looking at the source code for the test it should be obvious what the, the what code relates to what phase and it, it, if we have a lot of noisy code in our test and the test method goes on for hundreds of lines it, it, you can't look at that and know what's going on uh, unit tests should be quick to execute ideally like less than 10 milliseconds because we're gonna have you know thousands of unit tests as we develop our code over time and we want to run them to know that we haven't introduced any errors in existing code that we've already created so we need them to run quickly and uh, a good unit test code is treated with as much care as production code it's not treated as an afterthought or as uh, something that you know is like a second class citizen it's first class citizen so um, that's it for my little PowerPoint. This little diagram here is a picture of what I just described. Here's the system under test in the center, and we have the four phases of our test cases. And uh, as people in the chat are reporting problems with audio, I I I can't can't help there. Um, it's going to be something on your end. I've, I've done everything I can from my end. Um, and the system under test may interact with the environment which we are controlling with use of a test double. And the test double is where Google Mock is going to come in. So Google Test is what we use for the setup, the exercise, the verify, the teardown. Google Mock is what we use for the collaborators of our system under test. The uh, Google test documentation has a good user's guide 
it has a, a good reference, a bunch of reference sections down here, the testing reference, the mocking reference, the assertion reference, the matchers reference, actions, and so on. We'll go into this in a little bit more. Um, this documentation has incrementally gotten better over time, and uh, I, I'd say it's pretty complete right now, although some of the details are kind of glossed over pretty quickly. If you've done testing before in other frameworks or in other languages, then <clears throat> it, it will be it will make sense but if you're completely new to testing it might be a little bit difficult to, to grasp at first so um, a good reference for understanding unit testing in more detail is this xunitpatterns.com and right now uh, the site appears to be offline so I'm grabbing a snapshot from archive.org but this uh, XUnit Patterns site is kind of distilled information from the XUnit Patterns book that, um, I'm trying to remember the author's name here, that he published, I, th I believe, in like 2006. Uh, yes, it's, he doesn't have his name on the text, only in the picture there. It's uh, Gerard Marzius or something like that. I'm sorry, I'm pr not pronouncing his name correctly. But the idea of a test double is to have your, your system under test depends on something outside the code you're trying to test. So you're using a test double to supply these indirect inputs to the system under test. The direct inputs are like the function call arguments uh, that you're passing in directly. If it's a, a class you're testing, you may have direct inputs that come in through the constructor and then inputs to the, the method. But when it talks to anything else, those are indirect inputs to the system. And in order to control that the, syst that the test we are writing is repeatable and independent and isolated, we need to control the secondary inputs. So we use a, a, a test double for that. The three, um, actually, I did have more on my PowerPoint, but we will just go straight to here. The three, um, we're going to look at three open source projects. The first one is this project called Iterated Dynamics. It's a fork of the DOS, uh, a 16 bit DOS program, as in MS DOS, that is a fractal generator. It used to when operating as a 16-bit DOS program, it would talk directly to the video hardware and so on. And uh, so it has a long legacy of, of code. And because the DOS environment was so restricted, it has certain amounts of craziness going on inside the code. It tends to communicate through lots of global variables. So when we make changes to this code, we want to control those changes by using tests. A similar... Uh, project that we're going to look at is uh, Threaded Read, New Read News, TRN. This is a Usenet news reading program. And Usenet isn't very popular much anymore. It's still used, but not nearly as popular as it used to be. It's kind of been replaced by web forums. Usenet still has some advantages over web forums, like the fact that Usenet is distributed, so there's no central uh, weak point to drag the whole set of conversations into the, the void if you know if you're on a web forum and that particular website goes down you can't ever access that forum and if that never comes back online then the, even the archive of everything that was ever said in there is lost forever unless it was mirrored on archive.org or some other mirroring site um, but threaded read news is a 45-year-old program. Uh, Fractant itself is like a 35-year-old a, a program. And uh, my own little fork here of this called Iterated Dynamics, I, I forked it like maybe 10 years ago. And I've been working on it recently. And Threaded Read News, uh, I've been working on this program recently. 
And so I've added some unit tests to this code. This is a legacy code situation. So we'll see how to take some legacy code, get it under test, and how to uh, take some existing code and decouple it because it wasn't designed to support a test double. So we've got these indirect inputs coming into this legacy code that we need to control. The third open source project that we will look at is a project called the Optics Toolkit. This is a set of libraries and example programs for the Optics uh, GPU ray tracing API. And so this is a greenfield project. So we will see what it looks like when we are uh, writing tests in a greenfield scenario and, and how that's different. So back here to the first thing we need to do, if we go to our little bullet list of stuff we were going to talk about, the very first thing is how do I get some code isolated so that I can test it at all? The easiest way to do that for C++ code is to take the code. So in these legacy code bases, I don't have libraries. The code is not organized into a library. It's just organized as Here's an executable, and it's built from all these source files. So the first thing you want to do <clears throat> is to take your code and see if you can extract a library from your executable so that you can write a test executable that links against the library, and then your application also links against that library. So here I will show you. Here's a... Uh, GitHub change where I did exactly that. I've got a CMake build for this code. This is for iterated dynamics. This is the change set where I extracted. I had a library. Uh, sorry, I had an executable called id id for iterated dynamics, and I'm going to extract a library from that executable. So let's expand uh, the context of this change a little bit more. So we can see. So previously, in CMake terms, I had add executable, and then I just had all the source files listed to go be compiled and linked into that executable. So what I do is I'm going to extract out just the main. So th for a C++ program, that's a console program. The entry point is main. We're going to take the guts of the original main, put that in another function, and then we're going to have our new main call that new function. So this new source file, main.cpp, is just going to call into the extracted main, and all the other source files and header files are going to be part of this library instead of part of an executable. And then I will take all my compile options that I had previously set on the executable, they'll be set on the library. Here's my renaming of the main function so that I can call it uh, so that this code that's there, there's a bunch of source code in here. If we expand this down, there's a, there's you know a bunch of junk that happens inside main. If we want to test that, we can't have it in main. We need to have it in some other function that we can call. So the easiest thing to do is just to rename that function and leave the rest of it alone and then write yourself a new main that just delegates to the previous function, the previous version of main that's now been renamed. And uh, because this is a, a, I have a Windows application here, there's win main, right? Win main is the entry point for a Windows application and it's calling that that renamed main function from the library. So if you do all that, now you've got everything moved into a library instead of an executable. And if here's the uh, this is a, a commit of the code that's much, much later than the, than this commit that we saw here that's extracting the library. This was done. Uh, February 19th, so it was done a while ago. Uh, so this is what my source code looks like now inside Visual Studio. Here is my executable. It's just got that 
at, at this point I've just moved off WinMain into its own little source file, so that's the entry point for a Windows application, and it's calling down into that idmain function that I had renamed, and my all my source code is sitting off in this library called libid, and then my test code, let's squish this up a little bit, my test code is linking against that library. So, first order of business, get your code into some kind of situation where you can write tests against it. That usually means if it's not already a library, but if it's bound directly to an executable, that means extracting a library so that all the code that you want to test is in a library, and then you can have your test executable link against that library, which here's the CMake uh, lists.txt for my test executable, and I link against the library containing all my application code. I'm also linking against GMock. Uh, GMock and GTest both have a form that you can link against that will provide the main, the implementation of main, so that your source code just contains tests. So that's the first part here. Uh, how do I isolate my code so that I can test it? Get it into a library. Uh, it can be a static library or a dynamic library. It doesn't particularly matter. Um, the point is, you just want to get it into a state so that you can link against it, include the header files representing the, the code that you want to test, and then invoke, in my case, this is legacy code. It's, it's all written in terms of functions, so I'm going to be calling functions and uh, validating the result of what those functions do. Now, what about um, dependencies? So, an interesting, we'll, we'll look at two ways of doing it. First, we're looking at how to decouple some code from a dependency using a runtime decoupling technique by uh, adding a, a function overload. So, if we look at, if we go back over here and look at TRN. So here, uh, in TRN, they have these uh, strings that get, that get interpolated. And in their interpolation syntax, if you have percent open curly brace, let's make this a little bigger. If you have percent open curly brace and then a name and then close curly brace, TRN will take that name and look it up as an environment variable and then take the value of the environment variable and replace the uh, curly brace expression with the value of the environment variable. So a call to get env, the POSIX function for actually get env might be part of uh, the C specification and not part of POSIX, but at any rate calling get env, well, in my test executable, I don't want it to call get env directly. I want it to call some function that I can control where I can say it should should have called get env with this input and then I'm going to supply the matching output. And that's what I've done here. This is This is my setup. So I'm saying expect an environment variable to be requested called foo, and its value should be the string value. Uh, this is part of my setup, and then here's my execute phase, and then I should expect that the results of that is that this interpolate call will have filled a buffer, and the buffer will contain the string uh, value. And uh, it, it's just kind of goofy the way that uh, th that this the way this function works is it returns a pointer past you know to the end so the character pointed to by the return value should be a null character. Now, 
how are we orchestrating this? Well, this MENV is a, a member of my class. Now, I, let me back up a second and talk about, you know, what's going on here with Google Test. So with Google Test, every time you write a test, it essentially creates a one-off class and the body of your test, all the stuff here in curly braces, becomes the body of a method on that class. Google Test and Google Mock are kind of macro crazy in the sense that they just kind of do everything with all these crazy macros. And that's what this test F is. It's a macro that comes from Google Test. So here we are over in gtest.h. You see that this macro expands to another macro. That macro expands to another macro and so on and so on and so on. That's why I say it's a little bit macro crazy that the it's not just a macro that expands to some code. There's multiple layers of macro expansion going on, resulting in setting up this testing framework for you to write a test case. When you use the test F macro, you are saying that this test case environment var value, that's the name of the test case, is associated with a test fixture called interpolator test. A test fixture is just a struct or a class that derives from this test class provided by Google Test. I, uh, all of the Google Test names are inside the testing namespace, but rather than clutter up all my test code, uh, I usually just do a using namespace testing to bring all those names into scope. So, in your fixture, you can have a setup and a teardown. So, if we go back over here, uh, we have a setup and a teardown, right? Those two of the four phases. The fixture has the ability to do setup that is the same for every test case, and then the test case can do its own additional setup. And the way that that works is when you use a fixture, first the fixtures setup method is called, and then it executes your code in the curly braces. And then when it leaves the scope of this curly brace, it executes the teardown code in the fixture. So when I said earlier, sometimes the setup and teardown code is hidden, that's how it is hidden. It, it's instead of repeating it for all of these test cases that are using the same fixture, it's factored out into a setup and teardown method on the fixture, and that code is executed by the test framework before and after every test. So that's how this MENV got created. It's a member of my fixture class. So the fixture class is constructed, the setup method on the fixture is invoked, then the test body is invoked, and then the teardown method is invoked, and then the instance of the test fixture is destroyed. So every time you run a test, a class is created, the setup method on that class is called, the body of the test case is executed, then the teardown method is called, and then the class instance is destroyed. So every time we run a test, all these variables are recreated from scratch. Sometimes, like I've done here, uh, initializing this plain old data type along to 6421, sometimes that initialization is all you need. Other times you need to do more elaborate things in the setup. And in this case, that is what I am doing. I'm doing a bunch of environment variable mucking and I am doing a bunch of function calls into TRN to initialize all of the TRN global state so that when I call my test case, TRN has already been initialized properly and configured for me to run my test case. And then I have to rip everything down in the teardown. And instead of repeating all this code for every test case, it's factored out into the fixture. Now, this uh, environment class 
it is a mock. So we'll look at the base class first, this mock environment. This thing has some helper methods and it has a uh, data member in it called getter. Now this thing is a mock function and you might say like you know what what is going on here it seems like there's a lot of uh, extra indirection going on and that's true so the way that um, I have <coughs> decoupled this code from calling get env directly is I have a, a std function that takes a constant character string and returns a character string and that is the signature of get env and if I supply a non-empty std function to this set environment uh, as an argument to set environment so if that thing's non-empty it will capture it in a static variable otherwise it will use the regular get env function from you know it's from studlib.h on windows this is where it's coming from i think uh, it's always part of studlib.h get env so my mock environment is using a mock function to replace get env my production code is going to call through that mock and that allows me to intercept those calls to get something from the environment so this is a dynamic uh, substitution that I'm making because I'm calling this function to install oops here in the setup in the constructor for this mock I am calling this function to set it's essentially a global variable it's a static but it has a setter so I'm um, using my mock function to set that static so that when the production code calls essentially calls get env it calls it through a wrapper function but when it when it calls that it'll call through my mock uh, so if you have a std function you can use a mock function to mock it and a on a mock you are setting expectations so it's, it's, this code is kind of noisy which is why I've pulled it out into a separate class there's not really any way to get away from the noise of configuring mocks with Google mock <coughs> it's just the style that they've chosen so first another macro expect a call this is how we configure an expectation on a mock object the object we the mock object we are configuring is this first argument that in my case is called getter we're gonna um, configure a so on a, on us on a mock function because a mock function is not a class we're not mocking a method we're mocking the function call operator on this std function right so std function is a class that has a function call operator so we are going to say that the function call operator should be called and in this case we have a single argument to our function and I'm using what's called a matcher to match against the argument of the actual call so I'm configuring an expectation the expectation will be in place when I call to my system under test which makes the actual calls the actual calls provide arguments those arguments are matched against these matching expressions to select the appropriate expectation to do something in response to a matching call so in my case the argument because it's a C style string I'm saying that the argument should be C style string equal to whatever this value is in name and if this call 
that I expect to happen is matched according to all the matchers for all the function arguments, then we will do something. And what we will do is one time only, we will return this value as the return value of the function. So if this were a function that returned void, I wouldn't necessarily have to do something in the uh, to supply a return value. Uh, but in this case, it's a getter. It's going to get a value from the environment. So I'm saying expect a call on the getter. The name should be string equal to whatever this uh, value here is, this, this variable name. And then if that matches, one time only, it will return the value. So this is noisy, lots of parentheses, and you know there's a const cast in there, yada, yada. So by encapsulating that into my own helper method on my mock environment class, that makes it easier. If you go back here to the interpolator test and look for this test case, it's percent foo. It makes it easier for me to say, yeah, I expect to somebody to ask for this environment variable foo, and when they do, give them this value, the string value. So that's me setting up my mock stand-in for the get env function. And I'm going to invoke the system under test, which is this interpolate function. And if we drill into it, that is just a convenience wrapper in my test fixture. So this is a utility method on my test fixture that is supplying boilerplate arguments to the actual system under test. That is this function called do interp. You notice it takes a pointer to a C style buffer and a size and a C style string that represents the pattern to be interpolated. There's so-called stop, stop characters and uh, there's an additional argument that I am just supplying null pointer here. If we drill into do interp, we see that it is a long legacy code function that has, let's see, it's got a, a big switch on the characters in the pattern and that whole thing is inside an if and that whole thing is inside a while and in each one of these cases has lots of ifs and other kinds of additional you know sometimes there's additional switch in there um, and th there's all kinds of stuff going on inside here so this is high cyclomatic complexity code that's doing all kinds of things we're not even to the end of it yet it's going on for hundreds of lines of code oh finally we're all the way down to the end and it you know re freed up a bunch of temporary buffers that it created along the way and then finally returning the place where it left off interpolating stuff from this string and now you know why go back to our test case now you know why I had this assert saying the return value should point to a null character excuse me a null character because our interp string to interpolate just contained give me the value of this environment variable and then it's the end of that string so the return value should be pointing after this thing that was interpolated it interpolated it into our buffer which you know it's a I'm, I'm holding it as a stood string but you know this is a way to get at it you know, again, extract a utility method to make my test easy to read and concise. And so that what should be in the buffer is the string value. So a couple things going on here. First, we have use of fixtures to get rid of duplicated setup and teardown code that's very noisy. And it's not the interesting part of our test. The interesting part of our test is to say concisely, Here's the value of this environment variable. Here's the pattern we're going to interpolate. Go do the interpolation. 
we should have reached the end of the pattern string and the pattern should have been interpolated to this result. We've done that by extracting a helper method here to just get at the result buffer in a concise way, a helper method here to invoke the system under test without a lot of noise, a lot of without a lot of duplicated noise in each test case, and we've got a helper class, this uh, mock environment that we're using to configure the environment. Now we can also use our mock environment to say the opposite, which is that you requested an environment variable, but that environment variable did not exist in the environment. So what does that look like? What it looks like is, well, you call the getter with a matching name and we return null pointer. That is what get env does when you say uh, you requested a value of an environment variable that does not exist in the environment. So you get back null pointer. So in our interpolation case, test case, this uh, curly brace interpreter, sorry, the curly brace interpolation for environment variables in TRN has a special syntax to supply a default value for the environment variable when it is not set. And that is the syntax af inside the curly braces. You specify the name of the environment variable and then a dash and then some string up to the closing curly brace. And if the environment variable is not set, it supplies the value of the string after the dash as the default value. So again, we say interpolating that pattern should have, in should have consumed the entire string and the value of the interpolation should be this string not set. And as you might guess from that big switch statement, there's a lot of different things that can be interpolated in the TRN program. It uses all this interpolation to allow you to have a template for a message that you're going to post. And the template is filled with all these magic percent strings. And then the percent strings expand into values grabbed from the environment or from the article that you're applying to or for uh, other purposes like the name of the news group or the number of the uh, articles in the news group and so on. There's, there's, there's many different things that can be interpolated. So to validate that they, all this interpolation works correctly, this is what we did. And <clears throat> by going through all this interpolation, uh, there were actually several bugs found in that complicated massive switch statement as you might imagine trying to get through each and every single one of these manually in the debugger well that is a non-trivial exercise and so by controlling the indirect inputs into this function you can see there's access to global variables there's the call to uh, get env and there, there, there's other aspects of the runtime environment that are causing things to get interpolated here. By controlling all those indirect inputs we can get uh, the code under uh, fixed circumstances so that when we interpolate one of these patterns we get a reliable and dependable result out. So in case of code let's go in fact let's go look at uh, let's go back up here so this how did I get this environment plugged into the actual runtime code if we drill into this mock environment it calls set environment so this thing set environment it'll either default to get EMV or it'll be whatever function I've jammed in there. And inside this source file, this env.cpp, this is the where all the environment variables are fetched 
and used to initialize global variables yuck but that's how it works that's initializing the environment and you might say okay uh, this looks like a call to get env but instead it's calling through this s get env fn which if we look at the definition of that that is a std function that takes a pointer to a constant string c style string and returns a pointer to a non const c style string uh, with legacy code you often notice that the const and non const stuff gets in your way a lot more things are non const than you would like so by using this uh, setter I can set this function, std function, that everybody is going through. Uh, it defaults to get env. So if I don't do anything, it's going to, the production code is going to be doing exactly the same thing it was doing before, which is calling through get env. I've, in, I've basically inserted a level of indirection using a std function intermediary. And so all this code that used to call get env directly, it now calls s get env fn and that happens throughout any place that I'm uh, it, it turns out all the environment variable stuff is localized to this one file so uh, by just doing it in this one file I, I've got control of everything now what if you don't want to put in a dynamic level of indirection but you want to do things statically for whatever reason you can't insert std function or you uh, you don't like the idea of this extra runtime overhead I mean I would say just always measure it before you determine that it the overhead is too much chances are it's not even going to show up on any kind of performance trace this uh, get EMV stuff is only happening when this application is initialized and that's not the slow inner loop of this application however it's handy to know multiple ways of decoupling things here I've decoupled it by changing what used to be get env calls and now they're calls to something else they're calls to this std function that is initialized to get an env however sometimes you want to decouple things statically and not dynamically so what does and that means I mean a std function is kind of a poor man's way of doing dynamic polymorphism right it's not through inheritance but it's through an abstraction mechanism that gives you a dynamic a dynamically changeable point so that all the calls are redirected somewhere else so what if you want to do it statically so I, I'm now I'm in uh, iterated dynamics I've switched projects Let, let's look at this uh, production code that I want to test so iterated dynamics being a fork of a 16-bit DOS program in a 16-bit DOS program there's no GUI framework or anything like that for you to invoke so every application tended to roll its own user interface system to abstract out repeated user interface operations in this case this code has a big hairy function called full screen prompt it takes a heading for the prompt screen it has the idea of a number of prompts here's the array of strings that consist of the labels for each of the prompted values and then there's an array of these full screen value structures that represent a parameterized description of what each of the values are that are being prompted for there's a function key mask and an extra string that these two things are not so important for what we're going to look at right now what we're interested in is this array of prompt strings and the corresponding array of value descriptions and the number uh, this num prompts it, it determines the size of both of these arrays so what used to happen in all this code uh, 
fact, we can probably find one real quick. I haven't converted them all. Yeah. So what would happen is you would declare these arrays. So an array of uh, pointers to strings or an array, an, an array of, uh, yeah, an array of pointers to strings and an array of corresponding uh, value descriptors. And then you would start filling these arrays. So here's the prompt string, here's the type of the value, and then here's the initial value to be displayed in the prompt screen. So if you've ever done uh, GUI dialogues, you have two phases of interaction, interacting with the data. You populate the dialog with all the current values, let the user interact with the dialog, and then when they accept the dialog, you read all their modified values back out of the dialog and store them back into the program. This code, even though it's a DOS program, is doing exactly the same thing. It's got this crazy structure of unions and stuff going on inside here where every prompt string has an associated value type and then there's uh, the initial value that's populated into this value descriptor and that's what will be displayed on the screen for the user to edit you populate a bunch of these things you call full screen prompt and when full screen prompt returns the value descriptors will be modified to contain the edited values put in by the user so then you start reading all the edited values back out into your application state which in this case it's a big pile of global variables that's a really cumbersome and repetitive way to specify a prompt screen so the idea is to use a builder pattern that's what this uh, choice builder class is going to do the choice builder is going to build the array of prompts and it's going to build the array of value descriptors based on the name of the method so in this case it's a yes no value so here is when you, when you build a yes no value you give it the the prompt the string that's going to be associated with the value that describes what the value means and because it's a yes no value we're just going to supply a bool if we're requesting an int or a long or a float we have different methods to do that and what that means is let's look at a usage of this what that means is that building this dialog looks a lot simpler there's uh, a reset things because there's actually a go to loop here so we need to meet, make sure that we reset the the choice builder every time so here's a yes no value an integer value and then based on some state we're going to ask for another yes no value and four floats then we're going to ask for two more floats another yes no we've got some comments here which are values that represent just text that's put on the screen with no associated editable field so this is much more compact and concise but we wanted to develop this choice builder in such a way that we could unit test it to validate that choice builder was creating these arrays that are ultimately going to be fed to this routine called full screen prompt so we're trying to write tests against the builder we're not testing full screen prompt full screen prompt is an indirect dependency of the builder so we want to decouple the builder from this full screen prompt code we'll do it statically by saying hey this uh, choice builder class it was already a template it was templated on the number of prompts that we're going to build if we scroll down in this source file the two arrays that are maintained they're, they're uh, not dynamically sized, they are fixed size. So we use a std array for the choices and the, and the values. 
So it was already a template class. So we can introduce a little decoupling, a little indirection by saying, hey, there's an additional template argument called prompter. And if that template argument is not supplied, it will default to this implementation of a class, which has a function call operator taking the exact same argument signature as full screen prompt. And so it just delegates its function call operator delegates to the production code full screen prompt. So in the production scenario, choice builder, if we look back here at the use of choice builder that we are looking at, we see here choice builder is instantiated with a template argument that just says the number of choices that we want to build. But for testing purposes, we can supply a different type for the prompter so that when we ask the choice builder to prompt the user for input down here in this prompt method, it's going to invoke the function call operator on the supplied prompter. This is an instance of the template argument that was supplied to the class that template argument defaults to the production code that's going to call the real full screen prompt class. But in my test, let's look at the test now. If you look at test choice builder, I have a prompter that implements the function call operator as a, this is a struct implementing a method called prompt. I don't think there's a way to, it probably is, but it would be syntactically confusing or, or noisy to, I don't think there's a way to use Google's, this mock method comes from Google mock. And this is how we create a mock class. I'm mocking a method called prompt. Then I'm going to use a shim that implements the function call operator and delegates to my global prompter. Now, this global variable, it's a bit disgusting. It also means that it's possible that if I needed two different implementations of this mock prompter, that I wouldn't be able to run the two different test cases that need two different mock prompters. I wouldn't be able to run them simultaneously because I've only got a single global variable, right? Global variables are bad. But uh, when you're statically decoupling, you have to decouple through static things. I if you need to have this static resolve into multiple dynamic instances, you can do that by putting some kind of a you know, a look up in here, or you maybe you construct this, uh, you know, you register a bunch of identifiers. You, you, you can always add an extra level of indirection to solve a problem. It hasn't been a problem for these test cases because they're basically so simple. So if even if they're running in parallel, using the same prompter is fine. Um, so I've got this shim that implements the function call operator. And the shim is the extra template parameter to my builder. So what happens is this choice builder creates an instance of this template argument as its prompter. And my prompter has a function call operator. <coughs> I suppose I could have put, I could have put this, uh, virtual method, the mock method inside here, uh, it, it gets more complicated because see this shim is constructed by the choice builder. So things get interesting if you want to put this mock method inside the shim. 
But at any rate, the shim is how I am statically decoupling my system under test from the full screen prompt function, which I'm mocking. So what does that look like? Uh, again, I've extracted a utility method in my test fixture. So these are fixture oriented tests. And this test choice builder prompting is the fixture. Here's my utility method. It says expect to call on the prompter with a, a call to the prompt method with these arguments. And if that happens, it will one time only return this value, which happens to be the key code of a, of a key that was pressed to satisfy the dialogue, whether it's, you know, return, enter, or escape to cancel the dialogue. I'm using matchers here. Underscore is a matcher that matches anything. If you supply a value that is, <coughs> has to match that value directly. So I'm using a constant here, so that it has to match directly, and then two more wildcards at the end. And then I have these things. And as you might tell from the fact that they are underscore snake case, they are not matchers provided by Google Mock. Google Mock, if we just go back here really quick, if we go to Google Test Users Guide and you go down to the matchers, there's a whole bunch of matchers that are supplied by Google Mock for various scenarios. Always consult those to make sure that you are not reinventing the wheel by writing your own matcher. Uh, in my case, <coughs> I have these two arrays. I have one array that's an array of strings, and I have another array that has these crazy value descriptors inside there. And when I say expect choice value, like I did in my test, like down here. So here I constructed my choice builder with a static polymorphism mock injected. And then I'm saying there should be a choice value where this is the choice string. And then this is some description of the value that should have been used. I'm going to call a yes no, the yes no on the builder. I'm going to call prompt on the builder to, you know, build a yes no field and then prompt for it. And then I expect that um, there should be one value in this count method returns the number of things that I've built into it. So there should be one thing built into it because that's all I did before I prompted. So this has yes no thing is a predicate that I'm building as a lambda. And this gets kind of involved. Let's go let's look at it this way. Let's go this top down. So in Google Mock you supply matchers for the arguments. I've got two custom matchers that I've written called has choice and has value. Uh, let's look at the has choice one. It's going to be simpler because it's just taking the string. And uh, so this has choice. You define a custom matcher in Google Mock with these matcher macros. They're kind of disgusting, but that's the mechanism that's provided. This is the name of the matcher. These are the arguments to the matcher. That's why this is a matcher P2. It takes two parameters. You can have an optional description string here for the matcher. I just always use uh, an empty string, and Google Mock will construct a description programmatically. And inside the matcher, the thing you are matching against is named arg. 
So in my case, has choice, I'm matching against that array of strings. So string index n should be equal to the supplied string. And if it's not, I'm going to emit this descriptive message saying, I expected to get this string, but instead I got some other string that didn't match. And return false, because the matcher did not match. Now, in the positive case, it's best to also provide a descriptive string. So I just say that yep, it has the thing that you expected, and I return true. So that's the has choice matcher. That's pretty straightforward. So I'm saying expect a choice value. In this case, this is a single. This is test cases revolving around building a single prompted field. So I'm always using index zero and the prompt. And I'm saying the value for index zero should match whatever this predicate is. Uh, if we look at has value, we see that it just says take the predicate, invoke it on this listener, which is just a thing that you can emit messages to, and the nth argument in that array. So arg is the array of value descriptors and has value n with a predicate. We're going to take value descriptor n and feed it to the predicate and the result of the matcher is whatever the predicate says. Uh, the reason we pass the listener in to the predicate is so that the, the predicate can write descriptive messages into the listener to say whether or not it matched whatever piece of this value thing is. What, I mean, just to show you what this value struct looks like. So this full screen value, this is the struct we're matching against. So it's a discriminated union. This type field is the discriminator. And then here's the union. But the union also has a nested struct as one of the possible uh, one of the possible entities in the union. So we have a struct inside a union, inside a struct. Furthermore, these uh, full screen value things, they're not accessible from the outside of the builder. They're private to the builder. So if we take a look at Uh, let's just go back down here. Way down here. If you look at Choice Builder, the arrays are private. So we can't just access them from outside in our test. But what we can do is write a matcher that uh, allows so when when we call prompt on the builder it will call prompt on the prompter and it will pass those arrays as arguments to the prompter and if we have a mock prompter we can intercept those arguments we can write a matcher against the arguments the matcher if it matches then our expected call will succeed if the a matcher does not match the expected call will not be satisfied and when uh, mock objects are torn down they fail or succeed the test based on whether or not all their expectations were met or not so it's kind of a roundabout way to get at things but we'll look at an even worse example when we look at uh, our third project but let's finish off here with this how this has value works. So this takes a predicate. The thing I don't like about Google matchers, writing custom matchers, is this arg and the arguments to this macro, they end up being templated types in the implementation when we expand this big matcher P2 thing. It expands into a giant template class with another nested template class inside. And so these types become 
inferred by template deduction, template argument deduction, which means it's difficult for you to understand, like, you know, what exactly is the type of this thing without referring to the context in which it's used, which, which I'm not particularly a fan of. So what I did is I have this full screen predicate and that is a customization of this listener predicate. A listener predicate is a std function. The function takes a pointer to a match result listener. That's this result underscore listener thing that we've been seeing in this code in these matcher macros. Result underscore listener is a name that's brought into scope by the matcher p2 macro. So that's why it's, it, it, it has to be called that. Here I can call this whatever I want because this is my signature. So a listener predicate is a thing that takes a listener and some value of type T and it returns a bool. So a listener predicate on this full screen values struct, this struct is our crazy discriminated union where one of the members of the union is a nested struct. So we're going to write predicates on that thing. And that's what a full screen value predicate is. And that is what is accepted as an argument to this expect choice value helper function that I've written in my fixture. So if we go back and look at where that is invoked, here's a simple example that you know, uh, when I call the comment method on the builder, it should have built a corresponding choice string that matches the supplied string that's the argument to the comment method. And the value descriptor will have a type field that's equal to the asterisk character. So this is my little predicate has type. And Remember that a predicate is a std function that takes a listener and it takes a value and then it returns a bool. So this has type function is a factory function that constructs predicates. The predicates are lambdas. The argument to has type is bound into the lambda so that the lambda can take the type from the value to be matched, this full screen values structure instance that I've called value. So we're going to compare against the field in the struct against the expected type that's bound into the lambda. And if they don't match, then this predicate spits out a message saying, I expected you to give me this and I got this other thing instead and the predicate returns false. Otherwise it says, I got the thing that you expected. So it's kind of, it, it, it's kind of elaborate. We have this GMock matcher that we wrote called has value, right? Has value takes a predicate that it applies to the argument. It's actually the nth argument in the array because it's an array of these full screen value structs. It applies the predicate. The predicate is the thing that helps out the matcher to say whether or not the argument, which is complex because it's this discriminated union, it can have a lot of different values. We're going to use the predicates as a way to narrow down what those discriminated unions should contain. Now, you might say, ah, it's, it's great I, if you just check in the one field, the type field, but what if it's something more complicated? Um, you know, like this has, yes, no. I can capture the expected Boolean value. I can check the type. I can check the initial value. This uh, Boolean represents the initial value that went into the dialogue. 
not whatever the user might have typed. So this is, we've configured the dialog, we call prompt, we call full screen prompt, we're validating the arguments to full screen prompt. So we're validating the inputs to that function that are configuring the dialog for the user to edit. So these are the initial values that we're validating. <clears throat> and you might end up in a situation where you need to specify uh, multiple predicates. I didn't need to do it here, but you can write a simple combining function like has all that combines multiple predicates into a single predicate. And then when the matcher invokes that single predicate, the combining predicate, the, the, the single predicate that, it, predicate that is applied is a combining predicate that has references to all the other predicates and it applies the, the input argument against all of the predicates and builds a compound result saying it either matched all the predicates or maybe it ma depends on the kind of combiner you write. You can write a combiner that says it has to match all of them, it has to match at least one, or it can match, you know, some number of them. It, de it depends on the complex structure matching that you're trying to do. And we will see an even more complicated structure matching in a moment when we look at this next project. So, custom matchers, they are described in the Google mock documentation at the very end. And you might have noticed, like, I said a lot of things that technically might be mentioned in this short piece of text, but they're not necessarily mentioned. It is, can maybe implied. Uh, it, this is documentation here is a little bit terse, um, but it always helps to work from an example. So these, all these examples are open source, and you can look at all those examples. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned yet is what happens when a test goes wrong, and the answer is uh, that Google test will print out a message. <coughs> now, your application will almost certainly have custom data types like this full screen value struct and Google test will not know how to compare those custom structs by default. So you write comparison operators, operator equal equal, operator not equal, to compare your custom data types in your application. Furthermore, Google Test doesn't know how to pretty print any of those types. So again, you write your own pretty printers by writing either a stream insertion operator, operator less less, on a std o stream. Either write a stream insertion operator, which is probably the most recommended or sometimes it's not feasible to write a stream insertion operator because you're not supposed to define functions in other people's namespaces and for stream insertion operators to work they have to be defined in the same namespace where the corresponding value type or corresponding class type has been created so for instance you can't write your own stream insertion operator for classes declared in namespace standard because that's technically violating the standard. Only the standard is supposed to define things inside namespace standard with exceptions listed for user customization points of which stream insertion operators are not one. So, because argument dependent lookup won't find those stream insertion operators, <coughs> Google test has another mechanism where you can define a print to function that instead of taking a reference to an O stream, it takes a pointer to an O stream. So if you're having trouble getting your values pretty printed with a stream insertion operator, you can try the print to function and Google test will look for either one of those. I believe it prefers the stream insertion operator if it finds one first. And in when all else fails, Google test will print your blob your T as an array of bytes. So you will get something, but 
it's not very useful to have an array of bytes for your struct because those that array of bytes will include padding bytes which may be filled with junk or whatever you know they're not meaningful values and so on in a discriminated union you can't tell you know what union member is actually being used right because it's just a bag of bytes and the bag of bytes is as big as it takes to hold the largest member of the union plus whatever padding may be inserted by the compiler and so on so you always want to write comparison operators for your custom types and stream insertion operators for your types so what does that look like if we go look over it optics toolkit uh, this over here so here's an example of some printers for these application defined types you know here's the type defining a struct defining a directional light source let me just look at what that struct definition is it is two float threes a float three is a CUDA data type these are CUDA applications in optics and <clears throat> float three is a CUDA type that uh, if you drill in far enough you will find that it is a struct with three floats and some decoration to be used on either CUDA device code and uh, CUDA host code. So this directional light, it's got two float threes. Our printer is defined as a stream insertion operator. I'm kind of printing out some kind of something that's like vaguely JSON. It's not actually JSON, but it's it's, it's vaguely JSON like. And you might say to yourself, well, wait a minute, uh, where what about the stream insertion operator for that float three thing? And the answer is that we wrote those for Optics Toolkit in a little shader util header file. There's uh, VEC printers for all these two-dimensional, three-dimensional, and four-dimensional vector types that are used in CUDA. So we have um, 2D, 3D, and 4D printers. They just print the values inside parentheses. So this is printing my application specific structure using leveraging the printers for these float threes that are members so we have those as the stream insertion operators in my header file that's declaring these application structures I've written comparison operators for the structures uh, you write one that compares the fields and then you write the other one using the first one so my equal equal compares the individual fields and then my not equal says invoke the equal equal comparison and negate it to get the not equal case and the reason you do both is because sometimes you want to say this value should equal this value and other times you want to say this value should not equal this value now in uh, this code this was a greenfield project so when we had classes we put interfaces around them and we have rather straightforward mock implementations for the class so uh, let's look down here here's here's the pure virtual interface for an image source so all these methods are declared pure virtual there's no implementation and my mock image source just provides mock methods that override sorry this JetBrains thing keeps popping up a login window I uh, got an open bug on it but they haven't fixed it uh, in a release to build yet anyway we are uh, making mock methods to override all the methods in the interface so we're not we don't have to do any kind of crazy std function mocking or static template uh, parameter mock in you know, static polymorphism or dynamic polymorphism through a std function we can just do straightforward dynamic polymorphism using a mock interface and whenever they need the actual whenever they consume the interface we're feeding them the mock 
Uh, so this was all Greenfield code. It was, it was much easier to do mocking from the beginning. But we still had this problem that uh, all right we have this problem that include library types let's go over here go to I want to show you the thing we're going to be mocking all right here is the API function it's called Optics Excel Build. This thing, it builds a ray tracing acceleration structure for some kind of description of geometry. Not only does this take a large number of arguments, we have pointers to structs, we have an array of build inputs. Some of the inputs are represent pointers to device memory so memory allocated on the GPU for this array of build inputs which is the main input to this function this is the thing we want to match against it's a discriminated union of structs if you drill into these structs not only do they have a lot of members but some of the members in the struct represent pointers to memory allocated on the GPU and that GPU memory is an input that we want to validate against so just kind of unwind a little bit here and look at we got a bunch of arguments some of the arguments are pointers to structs a single struct others are an array of structs where each struct is a discriminated union of other structs. Those other structs hold pointers to device memory, and we want to validate all of those things. So that ends up looking fairly complicated, and we want to do it in an expressive way. So with a suitable amount of matchers and uh, predicates we can do that so here so this test case we're constructing a triangle acceleration structure for a PLY mesh a PLY mesh is just a file for PLY file format that holds geometric entities so this is all our setup code this is our execute code and this is our validation code and there's additional setup and execute code uh, setup and teardown code rather with the fixture we are using a fixture because we are using test F to define our test case the fi fixture is test geometry cache so what's going on here <clears throat> I've got these well this helper function is just doing some boilerplate setup for me it's constructing a shape definition what that is we don't need to drill into the details of and it is constructing a single triangle PLY mesh and giving me the shape definition for that single triangle as a PLY mesh file here I've written a little helper that says what my expected options are if we go back and look here we saw that that optics Excel build options was a pointer to a struct that was passed as an input to this function we're trying to configure the expected inputs to that function and the complicated part is specifying this array of build inputs so that's an array of discriminated unions where the members of the discriminated unions are additional structures and those additional structures have inputs that are written to the GPU memory before we make the call so we want to uh, 
combine a bunch of matchers. We do that with the all of matcher that's written by Google Mock. So this matcher, it comes from GMock matchers. Uh, we want to say that the expected build input array, it shouldn't be null, right? That's bad. And that we should have a triangle build input. If we go back over here and look at this build input struct, we see that one of the members of the discriminated union is a triangle array struct. And that triangle array struct has a whole bunch of stuff describing vertices and indices and additional flags and other things used to describe the tri a, a bag of triangles as <coughs> a build input to build a geometry acceleration structure for ray tracing. So we want a triangle build input at index zero of the array that triangle build input should have all of these qualities. It should have vertex coordinates that have been copied to the device. Those coordinates on the device should match this argument, which is a member of this buffers struct. So when we called single triangle PLY mesh up here to build the description, it filled in the buffers. So the device vertex coordinates should match the ones in our local variable buffers. So this is host memory and it's saying the device memory should match the host memory that we've configured for our test. Furthermore, it should have indices. So a triangle is built by supplying three indices into the vertex array every set of three indices defines a single triangle. It's commonly referred to as an indexed triangle list. And these array of host indices should match those device indices. We have some shader binding table flags that should be matched. It should have no pre-transform and no shader binding table index offsets. It should have no uh, primitive index offset and it should have no opacity map. So all this uh, no stuff, those are optional features of a triangle build input for a geometry acceleration structure. Those are all things we are not using. So we've specified predicates to say those things if they're present, it's an error. We, they should not be present. Furthermore, we've specified that this, uh, these, uh, these two things, these device things, not only should they be present, but we need to get it back off the GPU, back into host memory, and compare it to the expected values to validate those fields. And this one is uh, comparing host memory to host memory. So that's why the predicate doesn't have the word device in the name, but it should also have those flags. So as I said, when we looked back at the full screen values structure, sometimes you want to, this is the, this is a similar to what we just looked at. It's just slightly more complicated because we're going to check the type of the discriminated union before we apply triangle build input predicates to the argument and notice we're grabbing out the triangle array from the discriminated union at index n the n is supplied to this google matcher google mock matcher we're supplying the n and the predicate and let's go back over here a second so all of that, all of this stuff, the n is zero, and here's the bag of uh, combined predicates that we're going to use. I said we, you can write your own combiner. Google's combiner to combine Google predicate, uh, Google matchers is called all of, 
I didn't want to call mine all of where it only differed by the case of the first word. So I called mine has all, so it's distinct. It's not. It's clear that it's not the Google thing. And this is what it is. It's a var arg uh, template class. Sorry, it's a var args template, a variadic template function. It returns a predicate of t. It takes um, a list of predicates and builds a lambda that grabs the result of the first predicate grabs the result of all the remaining predicates and then combines them together and for testing purposes it's important to evaluate all of the predicates before you return the result and uh, in other words no shortcut return and the reason for that is because if you have 10 things wrong with your complicated struct you want to know all 10 things when the test fails so we need to call all 10 predicates to get all their messages before we return the result. Um, and then in typical variadic template function style, you know, this is the base case that just, you know, combining a single predicate together is just return that predicate. Otherwise, it's evaluate the head, put a little separator in the, the uh, message string listener, the message listener, you know, the result listener. Uh, and then evaluate all the predicates on the tail and then combine the results and have that be the return result of the combination. And then you have to write, you know, pretty printers and comparison operators for all these structures and so on. It, ge it gets involved. But those are all things that you can reuse across test cases and across programs even once you've got the framework in place now any program that's calling optics excel build I can write this kind of a matcher for the expected input and I can use that in a test where I've got the optics API mocked out and you really need to do all of this in order I mean, you can see there's a lot going on in this code and yet the t whole test case fits on half a screen right yeah, half a screen. And and the complicated part is this expected build input and by writing predicates a combiner to combine those predicates together and a matcher against the arguments to this function I can write the expectations of this very complicated function input in an expressive manner and then I can reuse that across other tests you can see here down here here's one where I'm building the acceleration structure for a single triangle from a PLY mesh but this time it also has vertex normals and because the uh, normals at the vertices of the triangles are not needed for the acceleration structure they're only needed for my application I have a separate matcher that's matching that in my application data structure this uh, mgom dot dev normals mgom is the result of exercising my application code it's a return value from exercising my system under test and these matchers applied we can drill into it they're passed into configure Excel build which set up the mock function call on the mocked out API this is the expected call you can see there's a lot of extra noise in here that's the same over and over and over every time I'm writing a test case that's building one of these acceleration structures so again pull the noise out into a helper function on your test fixture helper method it could be a function it could be a method if it needs access to instance data it has to be a method and now I can see I'm gonna call this Excel compute memory usage with the same build input and the same options 
as I use to build the acceleration structure itself. This uh, compute memory usage thing tells you how big your device buffers need to be in order to capture the result of the acceleration structure build. So you typically you call compute memory usage and then you call Excel build. But the fact that I've got these two inputs repeated, I don't need to know the details of what's going on here just to see at a glance. Well, they're taking the same two expected things and they're configuring an expectation. So that tells me that whatever Excel compute memory usage does and whatever Excel build does, they're both expecting the same two inputs. Those are the things that are varying between test cases. And it, it, it takes you a while as you write test cases to recognize the repeated boilerplate that you need to pull out into helper methods on your fixture so that you can end up with an expressive test. And you may need to write complex matchers and predicates and so on to match complex inputs on expected function calls. Um, and you can see down here, I'm, you know, doing, sometimes I'm doing not equal, sometimes I'm doing equal. It depends on the nature of the, you know, I'm just expecting that I, I don't care what the actual value of the acceleration buffer is. I just care that it's not an empty null pointer to device memory. Uh, same down here. I don't care what the actual value of the pointer is. I just care that it's not null. And then... I'm going to invoke my own matcher here. And you can see that the first thing this matcher does is just do some sanity check on the input. And then it's going to go and do a CUDA mem copy from the device pointer into host memory, which is uh, I'm using a std vector. I've resized the vector to have the expected amount. I'm copying the device memory to local host memory into this vector and then I am going to walk over that vector and compare all the values building messages as I go if they don't match. And that's what allowed me to have a concise verify section here. You know, whatever this pointer is, it should be a pointer to device memory that has the same stuff as is in this buffers object that I got when I built the shape. So, all of that. JetBrains, this thing getting a little annoying, but it is what it is. All right. So, that was a lot of talking. You can look at these. Uh, all this code is available on GitHub, so you can look at these test cases in more detail. But, the bottom line is to get to expressive tests. Let's go back over here. So we talked about using test doubles. Uh, test smells. This X unit patterns has a lot of really good information. The book is really good. Uh, it, it's language agnostic, so it is advice that is useful no matter what language you're programming in. But there are certain uh, smells that will appear in your test code. The one that we talked about mostly was test code duplication and we got rid of that by creating s uh, fixtures with uh, extracted duplicated setup and teardown work and we created helper methods to get rid of duplicated noise in our test cases so that our test cases are more legible, more readable, more understandable at a glance. So when they break and we go look at that test case. If it breaks, it's going to be like, well, this thing was supposed to be, you know, not null, but it was null. And then we can quickly read this setup code for this test case and say like, okay, I know what's going on here. It's because I changed this and now it's causing that not to get, you know, allocated correctly and so on. Um, and the way you get that expressivity is to use create what he's calls test utility methods. So we had, you know, setup methods. We had um, methods, uh, the, the, an encapsulation method when 
we saw that invoking that code to do the interpolation and TRN was really noisy, full of repeated noise, and it, and it wasn't enlightening us to see that noise repeated in every test case. The whole point is we're going to interpolate a string and get a result back. So by pulling that noise into a helper method, even though that method was only one line long, it made our test cases less noisy. It didn't distract us from what was going on. Uh, verification methods, what we looked at was how to push the verification into Google Matchers with associated predicates maybe on our complex structs so that we could write expressive matching against the expected inputs to functions that are on interfaces that we have mocked. Uh, and the, the cleanup method that you know we saw that when we had some teardown code in the fixture. Now, uh, one thing that I haven't mentioned yet, and it's it's more like CMake uh, boilerplate. Uh, let's take a look here. So here we are. We're in back in uh, Iterated Dynamics. <clears throat> iterated Dynamics uh, needs to interact with like GIF files, GIF image files on disk, and so on. In fact, if we go look over here, uh, go over here to Iterated Dynamics. Nope. Uh, yeah. Oh, it. That's what I, I called it. It. So if you look in my build directory, let me look in tests. I have in here a test data directory. And it has all kinds of little files containing test data that we're going to use in our test cases. Now, sometimes you just write hard-coded data that we compare against like this, you know, I expected because it was a single triangle and this triangle had normals associated with the three vertices that the number of normals should be three because it's a single triangle. Sometimes the single uh, value is enough. In the chat there's a question, how much effort does it take combining Google Test and CMake and VC Package? Trivial. Um, VC Package lets you get gtest as a dependency so you can just do find package on gtest in cmake to locate gtest and then you link against gtest poof you're good to go uh, so y using it is consuming it is really easy from vc package and cmake combined the wrinkle can be from cmake it's just it, it's just work it's just plain cmake stuff but what I like to do, I'll show you an example of this. What I like to do in my test code, I don't like to have magic values. So what I do, so here's a magic value, the path to this extension for GIF file. If I drill into that, this is a header file. It contains the path to that file in my build directory. I've generated this header file using CMake's configure file mechanism. So if we go over here to test uh, config, not that one, it's uh, yeah, test data.h.in. So this is a configure file. The configure file command in CMake lets you take a template, fill it in with variable values that are defined in CMake. So this is the generated file contains all the absolute paths to my test data files and I've uh, further uh, I did additional data configuration again this is all in github so you can look at the iterated dynamics code on github to see how this is all working but basically the idea is I pulled out all my configuration stuff into a CMake script. The CMake script sets all the values of these variables, calls configure file to generate the necessary uh, header files and other things that are used at runtime. In the taste of the, in the case of this uh, 
testconfig.h. This is a special text file that's an input to iterated dynamics. It defines video modes, and I've used CMake variables to supply all the values for the video mode so that when I read the file and validate it in my test cases, I'm not comparing against hard-coded values. I'm comparing against these names. And uh, let's see if I can show you that. Load config. You can see I'm using the identifiers defined in the header that was generated by CMake from the header was generated from CMake variables. So here's the one place where the magic number or string is recorded and every other place is using these generated header files to refer to the values symbolically so that if I ever change the magic value here for whatever reason I don't have to chase that magic value down in five different places so using CMake's configure file mechanism you can generate test data files in your build directory and have your test cases load those test files from your build directory exercise production code against those test files validate the contents of the test files by using symbolic names for the values rather than magic values I do this in iterated dynamics for testing a bunch of stuff and I also do it in TRN TRN has the ability to read all kinds of files off a disk representing news messages and representing other configuration files that are inputs to TRN I can configure those files from CMake as test data filled in with values I can then refer to the uh, values by symbolic name and validate the the production code that read the test data got the right value out by referring to the the values by their symbolic names so it's just it, it's nothing magical it's just extra CMake work using configure file but I found it to be handy and there's one final thing to mention using um, testing with CMake so in CMake there is a CMake module called Google test that gives you a command called gtest discover tests and what that does is it creates a ctest test case for every gtest test case and that means that over from your build directory here so I'm in the build directory for iterated dynamics I can say ctest uh, and then I can say uh, C test list presets I can be using oops I have to go over here C test list presets I've got a preset called default that runs all my tests so I can say C test preset default it runs all my G test test cases as C test test cases oh and I got a busted one I think it's because I didn't uh, I've got a slightly stale version of the code here but this test case here is a little bit different um, because that one is uh, I've got this image test and when you define a test with C test you can only give a single command but sometimes you want to do multiple commands in my case I want to run the fractal renderer generate an image and then run an image comparison tool against the generated image and a reference image so what I've done in order to make this happen is I write a C test uh, or sorry a C make script the C make script runs my executable to generate an image uh, it does a little file system manipulation and then it runs my image comparison tool over here my ctest command 
is to run CMake, define a bunch of variables from my script, and then invoke with dash p that script. So sometimes it comes up on Stack Overflow and whatnot. People say, I want to add a C test test that does more than one command. Well, you can't do it directly from C tests add test command because it only takes a single command. So what you do is what I've done. You make a CMake script that does the multiple commands and uh, you pass in whatever you need as defined variables to your CMake script. So that's the last little kind of trick up my sleeve that's being used in these uh, repositories. Uh, we do this I'm, I'm doing it here in Iterated Dynamics over in Optics Toolkit. We also do that. So if we go back up here to Optics Toolkit, you can see I have my build directory and my source directory. And if I say C test uh, pre, uh, preset VC pack, this is my preset name. And then I say run all the ones with the uh, Oh, let's just do it this way. Just run all the ones with the label image. These are all image-based tests where it ran some program and <clears throat> generated an image and then did an image-based compare on the result against a reference image. I think I did that right. I maybe need to... Maybe, uh, Oh, needed to be lowercase image. Sorry. Uh, so, yeah, it's obviously it's taking a little bit longer now because it's running these applications, generating an image file, and then doing an image based compare against the result with some reference image. So, that comes up about uh, how can I run multiple commands with C test. It's just kind of, it's not G test specific, but if you do that uh, trick. Let's get back over here. Uh, G test discover tests. That gets all your G test test cases as C test test cases, so you can get C test to drive everything. Uh, we have, um, you know, almost a thousand unit tests and integration tests combined in Optics Toolkit. Um, I got a couple hundred over in Iterated Dynamics and maybe a hundred or so over in TRN. Okay, so, wow, that was a lot of talking, but we looked at three different projects. We looked at how to do static polymorphism to decouple some production code from a, a, a nasty dependency, that full screen prompt function. We looked at dynamic polymorphism using std function to decouple some production code from a runtime dependency, namely the get EMV call. And we looked at just using plain old Google mock, mock classes to mock an interface that's used uh, as a collaborator for production code that was done in Optics Toolkit. But Optics Toolkit has the additional wrinkle that we want to validate very complex inputs to those mocked collaborators. And we did that with custom matchers. And in order to make an expressive uh, combination of predicates, we wrote our own little uh, predicate combiner and a series of predicates to validate individual pieces of these complex structures. And uh, I didn't mention it explicitly, but one of the reason that you, I, I wrote my own <clears throat> predicate combiner and individual predicates is because when validating data on the GPU I didn't want every single predicate to copy the data from the GPU back to the host I wanted to do the copy from GPU memory to the host once and then run all the predicates against the data that I'd copied over and, and that's not directly available with uh, Google Match sorry, Google Mocks matcher, matcher combiners, the all of, any of, etc. 
Uh, so that's why I had my own predicate mechanism and predicate combination. But the goal is to have a complex test have a short test body that's expressive and descriptive of what the test is doing without drowning you in details. So, wow, that was pretty long, but I hope that was uh, useful and we'll see what the, uh, the YouTube comments are like. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.